Hi. In this episode of Revival 101, we're discussing the Promise Keepers revival from 1991 to 1997. The biblical criteria of revival demand widespread repentance and good fruit, like evidenced on the day of Pentecost, the Ephesus revival in Acts chapter 19, and the revival in Judah under King Josiah. Moves of God like fire from heaven that fail to bring widespread repentance and good fruit fail to qualify even if the event itself is impressive, with many people falling prostrate and proclaiming that Yahweh is God or Jesus is risen. The remarkable fact of the Promise Keepers revival is that so many men went home and proved their repentance by their deeds and that proof of their repentance became notable in nationwide statistics on things like teen pregnancy and alcohol consumption. Make no mistake, many men leading the Promise Keepers revival in the 90s were flawed. But having repented from marital infidelity and other failures themselves, God used them to preach repentance, thus facilitating a change of destinies in many American families. Promise Keepers was a move of God whose most influential work was from 1991 to 1997 through series of books and large gatherings of men, often in large arenas and stadiums, culminating in a meeting of over half a million men in the mall in Washington, D.C. in 1997. They preached trust and surrender to Jesus, unity of Jesus' followers, and a return of man, men to our God-given roles as prophets, priests, and servant kings in our homes. Before assessing their fruit, their successes and failures, let's have a look at their message in this short excerpt from the meeting on the mall in D.C. Hundreds of thousands of men took this message to heart, got on their faces repenting and pleading with God. Then they went home from this meeting to take up their task in good conscience, looking to the Lord Jesus for the needed help along the way. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. God commanded Joshua with these words, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. In contrast, the divine judgment concerning persistent disobedience is this. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their fathers and the warnings he had given them. They followed worthless idols and they themselves became worthless. The third sin is that that characterizes our fall today is the sin of sexual immorality. Whenever God's people have forsaken prayer and obedience to his word, they become just like the pagan nations surrounding them. Our two most important walls against immorality are a passion for his presence and a hunger for his word. God's people in both testaments have always battled for purity and holiness, but their most persistent struggle was for sexual purity. They were constantly drawn into idolatrous worship. They were involved in licentious and perverted sexual practices. The new converts who came into the New Testament church were scarred by degrading and immoral life patterns, but they were instructed in the ways of the Lord and they were commanded 
to live a life of moral purity and holiness. Their God was a holy God, and he expected his people to live as though he were their father. Today, like ancient Israel, we easily capitulate to the mores and norms of a sick society. Today, many men in the church live no differently than their counterparts who make no claims for Christianity. Today, Christian men are in a profound struggle with their sexuality, and many of you men standing here are caught in the vicious grip of addiction to pornography. And you live daily with the helplessness of the guilt that accompanies the sin. The World Wide Web now provides a myriad of opportunities for weak-willed men and boys to view mind-boggling displays of moral filth. And for some, that web is the web of moral destruction. Professing Christian men are guilty of sexual abuse. And the toll of unfaithfulness in Christian marriages is now a generation of sons and daughters without fathers. Modern psychology has hidden us under the skirts of victimization. And now, it's nobody's fault. But we are sowing to the wind, and we will reap the whirlwind of destroyed marriages, damaged children, and quite possibly a globe-wide globe -wide expression of incurable sexually transmitted diseases, we need to stop now. As I was praying and considering whether this move of God met the biblical criteria of a revival, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. Look at the teen pregnancy statistics. My jaw dropped when I saw the data. Both the teen pregnancy rate and the abortion rate peaked right before the Promise Keepers revival started and saw their fastest rates of decline through the 90s. While there were probably other factors in play, how do we understand the repentance and revival of the fathers impacting teen pregnancy so strongly? Hosea 4.14 warns men of God, I will not punish your daughters when they turn to prostitution, nor your daughters-in-law when they commit adultery, because the men themselves consort with harlots. You see, men who are sexually immoral or consorting with prostitutes virtually through internet porn disqualify themselves from reasonably expecting sexual purity in their children. God rebukes the double standard, but having repented of their immorality, internet porn, and failures, God established millions of these men through promise keepers as prophets, priests, and servant kings in their homes. Consequently, there was a marked decrease in sexual immorality among their children. Promise Keepers was not primarily political. They emphasized men's role in their homes and churches rather than in government. However, we need to acknowledge that this revival was essential to the eventual overturning of Roe versus Wade. Teen pregnancy and teen abortion rates were reduced by more than a factor of two since the 90s. This meant that far fewer voters had the guilt of bloodshed on their consciences. This favored the election of presidents who appointed justices, the very justices who overturned Roe in the 2022 Dobbs decision. June 24, 2022 was the day I'd been hoping and praying for since I first learned what abortion was in 1977. Praise the Lord Jesus for the promise keepers. Per capita alcohol consumption nationwide was also lower in the 1990s than any decade since the 50s. Real revival bears good fruit. The impact of promise keepers was tremendous in the Christian home, but why didn't it lead to significant lasting church growth? At the Promise Keepers meetings themselves, there was a call for churches to repent from historical schisms and their resulting doctrinal litmus tests. Churches were called to base fellowship and to choose leaders more on proven biblical character than on the doctrinal minutiae 
that had given rise to historical schisms. But the institutional follow-through was simply less reliable than the repentance and follow-through of individual fathers in their homes and families. Rather than making disciples for Jesus alone, most churches continued to cite Amos 3.3 in defense of requiring agreement with doctrinal minutia as a criteria for church membership or leadership. Amos 3.3 says, How can two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? That verse really points to keeping covenant stipulations rather than doctrinal distinctions. Compare this with the repentance of the fathers in attendance at Promise Keepers. Most fathers left willing to give their daughters in marriage to men of Christian faith and character based on the biblical instruction not to be unequally yoked to unbelievers. Millions of individual fathers repented of requiring broad doctrinal agreement from those courting their daughters in favor of simpler evidence of trust and surrender to Jesus. Why did the Promise Keepers revival end with a sharp decline after that huge meeting on the D.C. Mall in October 1997? Perhaps they had simply accomplished God's purpose in their generation. Men went home to accomplish their tasks for which they had been renewed and revived at the Promise Keepers meetings. Ultimately, the purpose of this revival was to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers according to the work and spirit and power of Elijah. Since institutional Christianity largely failed in their institutional repentance, God's blessings rested instead on the individual homes. Real revivals propagate their fruit in the hearts of people rather than the perpetuation of institutions. Institutions are temporary tools for the work of God in the hearts of people. People and revivals are not tools for the propagation of human institutions. There is room at the altar, there is room at the pew, there is room at the table, a place for me and for you. It's not about being someone else, there's healing and being true, there is room at the cross for Tell me, do you care to obey Him? Hi. From 2016 to 2022, I've never asked for contributions and none of my platforms are monetized. I'm generally more favorable to giving to widows and orphans than to giving to preachers. The Holy Spirit has spoken to me. Jesus cares about the girls in these homes. I just completed Christian leadership training with Dr. Mark Rutland, who founded Global Servants. I've reviewed their financials, and I am impressed both with their accountability and the large proportion of contributions directly supporting their girls in Ghana and Thailand. Please visit their website, globalservants.org, and pray about giving to these girls. Tell me, do you care to obey him?